because she's different. All right, she's very, very, very different. And having an understanding of what she's going through will really help her a lot to be able to go through all of those processes, taking the right decisions at the appropriate time to, and ensuring that at the end of the day, we have a healthy mother and healthy babies. All right? So um, now that I'm pregnant, I'm sure that um, for our clients who are currently on this particular class, you probably are on different stages of pregnancy. There are some who are in their first trimester. There are some, next slide. There are some who are in their second trimester and then some that are getting close to delivery. But since this is our this is our first, this is our inaugural class, we're going to be starting um, from the beginning. And so uh, some of our patients probably would have passed the, the stage that we are talking about, but you went through it, all right? And what is that first stage? The confirmation of pregnancy. Um, I've, I've come to realize that particularly for women who go through IVF, that the most traumatic period of the whole process is what? What is the most traumatic period? Okay, when the eggs are being collected. Yeah. Some other people will say it's the two weeks after transfer. Why they are waiting to determine uh, whether they are pregnant or not. Some would say that ah, that's, that's it's so that is that up up it. until yes, up until that time. Every other thing is just activity. We're just going through, no yeah. problem. Everything is going on yeah. well. Doctor is assuring. But yeah. once the transfer is done, you're like, wow. These two weeks, two weeks become like two years. Yes. Will I be pregnant? Will I not be pregnant? How will I cope with the outcome? So that, that, that two weeks after transfer is a lot. All right, so... The two weeks will come and it will go. And then after that, we'll need to confirm whether the patient is pregnant or not. And um, for us, we for patients who are based in Abuja, we like to have them come into the hospital and have their pregnancy test done. Why do we do that? Next slide. Because we believe that... Um, we should be able to also provide them with that first initial counseling and to navigate them through the process, whether they are positive or negative. If they are positive, it will show with two lines. And that is what every woman desires, to be able to, to be told that, congratulations, you are pregnant. And it's so, it's so emotional because once you come into the clinic and you've submitted your blood sample, you are waiting. Any doctor or nurse that passes your front, you are looking at the person's face. Hi. To find out whether you can determine the results from their faces or not. But meanwhile, they don't, they don't, they can't tell because they just keep a straight face. The nurse will pass through you, doctor will pass. Even the lab scientists will also pass. They are trying to find out, ah, is this person, is he, is he happy? Is he like, ah, this is my result. And it's particularly worse when the result is taking a long time, when for you to be called into the office. And then when you are now called, as you are coming in, you are looking straight into the eyes of the doctor. <laughs> yes, you are looking straight into the eyes of the doctor to find out if it is positive or negative. Again, you still will not be able to tell. <laughs> All right, and they say, sit down. And then they start asking you questions. Say, this question, why are they asking me this question? Are they trying to tell me that? Until finally say, congratulations, you are pregnant. And like, wow, 
And then when they say, oh, sorry, the journey continues. For me, what I try to do, when once the test is negative, I, I don't tell you it's negative. I will tell you the journey continues. By saying the journey continues means that we have not gotten it. So we still have to continue with the process. Try again. Because it's actually, it is a journey, actually, because whether you are positive or negative, it's, it's something that is weighs in the balance. It can either go either way. There's no guarantee that it will either be this or this. For those that are positive, congratulations, you move to the next phase. For those that are negative, don't be discouraged. The journey continues. Right? You're welcome. <clears throat> You're welcome. You know. You know. You're welcome. So we're just talking about um, now that you are pregnant. You're welcome. Have your seat. So we're just talking about the first, the first phase where um, the pregnancy test is um, is is confirmed. So I was saying that. So once you do, once you you've done the test, so it's either you are positive or you are negative. Negative. All right. All right. Now, once you are positive, your little support begins immediately. Like I said before, many of you have gone through this phase already. You know, we're starting off at the entire classes after a very long time. So we're starting from the beginning. All right. So just to take us through what uh, we have done before and what is expected. All right. So once you have um, once you are pregnant, you start off the um, the luteal support, okay, and then you are given a two weeks appointment to come. Yes, you started off on your luteal support, and then once you are you are given a two weeks appointment to come in for your first transvaginal scan. <clears throat> The first test that is done that shows you are pregnant is what we call a chemical test, a biochemical test. The ultrasound is the test that determines, excuse me, that confirms clinical pregnancy. And that is done. Excuse me. Thanks. That is done two weeks after the positive pregnancy test. And when you do a transvaginal scan, this is what you expect to see. So patients are also not fully comfortable until they have done this. Ah, God, I'm pregnant. I hope you're welcome. I hope my test, I hope my, um, my scan will be okay. Because you can do a scan and there'll be nothing inside the womb, in which case it's a chemical pregnancy. Yes. Meaning that your test was positive, but when you did the scan after two weeks, there was nothing found inside the womb. If nothing is found inside the womb, there are two possibilities. Number one, it's possible that the pregnancy did not continue. The plantation did not continue, in which case, if you repeat the pregnancy test, it will become negative. Or if you repeat the pregnancy test and it's still very positive, it means that the pregnancy is not inside the womb, it's outside the womb, in which case it's an ectopic pregnancy. Yes, so ectopic pregnancy can occur even after an IVF process. It's not only natural conception that you can have ectopic pregnancy. But once you do the first scan and you are seeing this, that means you have a pregnancy that is inside the womb. And the purpose of this scan is to determine viability. All right? Is to determine viability if um, the pregnancy is viable. That means there's a heartbeat. 
to determine the number of babies you are carrying. From I, for IVF, you know, we normally transfer more than one embryo. So virtually all patients who have gone through IVF, they have the potential of having more than one baby. So when you are doing your first scan, part of what you want to find out, the first thing is, is it a viable pregnancy? Are we able to pick a heartbeat? Because as small as this pregnancy is, with a Doppler, you can pick a heartbeat. And once you pick the heartbeat, toot, 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 that means it's a viable pregnancy. The second thing you want to find out is how many sacs? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Don't say four. We don't, we don't want four. <laughs> we, don't, we don't even transfer four. I do with four babies. Even three. All right. So once we have determined that, that clinical pregnancy has been determined, then your luteal support continues. The luteal support is very, very important. For women who conceive naturally, they don't require the luteal support. Some of them won't, won't require it. Why? Because their system is still in charge, producing progesterone. But for women who go through IVF, you know, part of what we do is that we downregulate you. We suppress your body system so that we can be in charge. So once you get pregnant, your body is not able to support the pregnancy at that early stage. So you need to be on medications, progesterone in uh, insert forms or in injections or orals. You need to be on estradiol, oral forms and other medications to support the pregnancy for the first trimester. So you take it for about six to seven weeks, okay? And while you are taking that, you come in for regular scans every two, two weeks. And why are we doing scans every two, two weeks? Just to be sure that everything is going well. That baby is developing well, because we'll measure the size, check the heartbeat, and generally just check about your well-being, the well-being of the patient, okay? Next slide. So I've talked about um, the purpose of the first transvaginal scan. Now, it's possible that when we do that first scan, I've mentioned the fact that we could find nothing, in which case it's an atopic or a chemical pregnancy. It is possible that we could find a Peter Paul, go to the, the picture of the scan, do backwards. Backwards, yes. So it's possible we would do a scan and we will not find this. We'll just see the sac. The fact that we see this, you are pregnant, but there's no baby. Because this, is just the container. There has to be a baby inside. This is the baby that is going to grow and will come out. If we scan you and we don't find, and we find this and we don't find this, it means you have what we call a blighted ovum. Okay. Sorry. We are not seeing it. So we have, we from this side, we are not seeing yeah, it. This is the we, first are scan. Seeing the we are not seeing the screen, please. I'm not seeing the screen, please. Okay, okay, they're not seeing the screen. No, no. Okay, I'm going to see that they're not seeing the screen. All right. Okay. Online. Online. Hmm? Hmm? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes, is what is being displayed. That's what. I'm, I'm re referring to. 
you are seeing a picture of a scan. So I'm saying that if we do a scan and we don't see the, the baby inside, that means you have a blighted ovum. That means the baby did not form well. All right? Now, if we do the scan and we see the feta pole, this is the feta pole, we see the baby, but we're not able to pick the heartbeat. Now, if it's the first scan, you no, know, or if it's a scan and it's done early, what we want to do is to give some time. Maybe it's there, but we're not able to pick it. But usually, after the, at the first scan, by the time you are doing the first scan, the baby is already six weeks and five days. By the time you are doing your first scan, which is two weeks after positive pregnancy test, the pregnancy is already six weeks and five days. When you do the scan with the fetal Doppler, with the machine that we have, you should be able to pick the fetal heart. Now, if you don't pick the fetal heart, we will give one another one week just to be sure. And if after one week we still don't can't pick the fetal heart, what it means is that we have a missed abortion. That means it's there. You had you were pregnant, but the pregnancy stopped. But if we pick the fetal heart and you're bleeding, it means you have a threatened abortion. That the two words, they meet different things, threatened and missed. Threatened means that the pregnancy is being threatened, but it's there. And usually what will happen is that the bleeding will stop. And then the pregnancy will continue. But if it is missed, in which case we did not pick the fetal heartbeat at six weeks, five days, at seven weeks, five days, eight weeks, it means that it's a missed abortion. And that means that pregnancy did not, did not continue. And the first thing that most women, most couples will have in their mind is that, but why? Why did it happen? The major reason why you have a missed abortion or a miscarriage, most miscarriages in the first trimesters are as a result of fetal anomalies fetal abnormalities, whether they be genetic, chromosomal, structural, it means that the baby was not forming well. And so in order for you not to have an abnormal baby, your body system will just terminate the process. The process just gets terminated. And then you need to go through an evacuation process, which is much better than having a baby that is malformed, although very disappointing and very, very discouraging, but we we'll encourage our couples to take heart and continue with the journey. So you see, it's a journey that potentially has a lot of ups and downs. The fact that we have said congratulations, the lines are two positive, are two lines, does not mean that everything will go well. It's what we pray for. And that is why prayers are very, very important. Because there are a lot of things that are not within our control that, you know, factors can change. And that if, you know, we engage and trust in God, we believe that everything will go well. All right? Good. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so this, this is what we just talked about. Blighted ovum, missed abortion, and then um, threatened abortion. Next slide. All right, so you continue with the, with the luteal support for six to seven weeks, all right, until you get to 12 weeks. 
And so that what that means is that you have gone through the first scan, second scan, and everything is fine. All right. Once you once you've gone through the first and second scans and everything are okay, that more than eighty percent of the time it means that everything would would end up fine. Once you have passed the first trimester, which is thirteen weeks, it means that you have passed that hurdle, and bearing all abnormal any of foreseen circumstances, you should carry that pregnancy to term. Because it's very scary when you have 20 to 25 percent of all pregnancies ending in a miscarriage. So you you want to be sure that ah God, let me not be among that 20 percent too. So you're like ah, this first trimester, this first trimester. That's how we we see a lot of care is given in that first in that first trimester. You're on you're on support. You're 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 on luteal support. We tell the husband just. Just stay on your lane. Don't come close. Because <laughs> we don't want anything that would, uh, that, would, that would jeopardize. All right? And so you continue. And then for us at the Center for Women's Health, yeah, once you get to next slide, during this, during this period, a lot of women will begin to have a lot of... Um, a lot of symptoms. The first thing I want to say is that if you don't have any symptom, don't worry. It doesn't mean you are not pregnant. <laughs> I say, doctor, ah, I'm not even feeling pregnant at all. Are you sure I'm pregnant? Relax, be calming down. The fact that you don't have any symptoms does not mean you are not pregnant because some patients will not have any pregnancy symptoms at all. Why some patients will have some pregnancies? But some patients have pregnancy, they don't even know they have it. When you now start asking them, okay, do you feel weak? Okay, do you sleep more? Oh, yes. Your boobs are they bigger, tingling sensation? Oh, yes, yes, yes. These are all part of the, are you eating more? Ah, in fact, I'm craving some things that I don't, I don't used to crave before. All of those things are all part of early pregnancy symptoms. It's just that it varies from one woman to another. What may be your pregnancy symptoms, it depends on what, is your, what your pregnancy symptoms are. But generally speaking, the fact that you're not, you don't have any of the symptoms does not mean that you're not pregnant. And there are some who will have exaggerated symptoms, particularly those who are getting pregnant for the very first time for the very first time. Or those who have multiple pregnancies, there are some who are carrying two, some who are carrying three. The amount of symptoms will not be the same with those who are carrying one. So the symptoms vary. And so there are some people who have such symptoms that will require them to be admitted in a hospital. So it's very important. Once you are not like nausea and vomiting, which is a very common symptom that patients will have, once you're having nausea and you know, vomiting and you're not able to tolerate anything at all, anything you eat, you vomit, then that means you have to come into the hospital. If it's just once you vomit in a day, that one is normal. That one is emesis. That is normal vomiting. And it usually can occur any time of the day. Don't forget, you know, when they say uh, money sickness, it can be afternoon sickness. It can be evening sickness. That morning sickness is a misnomer <laughs> because it, it, it doesn't give you time. In the middle of the afternoon, you just suddenly just feel that urge to just throw up. If you don't throw up, you will not be yourself. It will happen in the night. Just maybe you want to go and sleep or maybe you just miss eating your dinner. Ah, or it could be in the morning. You know that most times it happens in the morning, so the same morning sickness. Mm -hmm. It can happen in the afternoon or in the evening. All right? And so once you have all of these symptoms, it's nothing to worry about. Most of them are usually not, not um, they're not challenges, all right? Just to know that you have, you feel like that. 
Some people may have cramps, abdominal cramps. It's normal. But when they become unbearable, very painful, then it may not just be the normal cramps that you may need to come in to the hospital. All right? So some women may have mood, mood swings. You just only just, just angry for your, with your husband unnecessarily. Ah, what have I done? The man is thinking that this my wife has begun to, to a mental problem has come. <laughs> ah, she just starts crying. Ah, why are you crying? Stop. <laughs> Men, calm down. Nothing happens. It's just that she's pregnant. So she's manifesting. <laughs> she's manifesting pregnancy. That's how we say the pregnant woman is a fourth, is a fourth human being. You can't, you can't understand her. All right, nothing has happened. It's just the hormones that are taking that are taking their toll. All right, so you understand all of that. Next slide. So once you have successfully completed your luteal support program, for us at the Judy Center for Women's Health, we would now the next stage is now for you to come in for your cervical cyclage, all right? Now, the one question you want to ask is, must I do the cervical cyclage? What is cervical cyclage? Well, sometime in the course of the Atlanta class, I mean, the Atlanta uh, classes, we will take um, a topic, we will treat um, cervical cyclage. But just to know that it's a procedure that is done where a stitch is tied, is put around the neck of your womb, the cervix, to hold the service so that the service doesn't open prematurely. And why do we do this? Normally, cervical cyclage is indicated for women with incompetent service. Incompetent service means that a service that is not able to carry a pregnancy to term to nine months that begins to open before time. So once that diagnosis is made, then the treatment will be to have a cervical cyclage. But the reason why we do it for all of our patients routinely, we offer it as a prophylactic service. Prophylactic means as a preventive measure. It's because we can't tell women who have incompetent service. About five to 10% of women will have incompetent service. And a lot of our women, this is the first time they are carrying pregnancy. And you don't want to use the IVF pregnancy to do whether experiment. Okay, sorry, you have a complete service coming. When, when, when you get pregnant next time, we'll put a stitch. Uh, a woman who waited for 15 years, went through how many IVFs before she finally got pregnant. You can't be telling her when you get pregnant again. So what we do is to just prophylactically just apply it. And then with that, we're sure that we've given an extra support to the service. So that is why we do it. So for women who have carried a pregnancy before, have delivered successfully, one, they may not need it since their service have been tested and everything went well. However, if they had a difficult labor, okay? If they had a difficult labor and they're not sure what happened during that process concerning their cervix, or if now they are carrying two, you no, know, before you carried one, now you are carrying two, two and one, they're not the same. You're not sure how your, how your service would hold with two babies, then the best thing to do would be to just have the cervical cyclage done, okay? So the cervical cyclage is done at 12 weeks, 12, 13 weeks to 14 weeks, usually after you are done with the, with the luteal support then you have the, have the cervical cyclage done, all right? It's not a painful procedure. It's done under anesthesia. We usually use spinal anesthesia, so you are awake. We do it, you spend a day, a night in the hospital, and then the following day you are discharged home. Usually no challenges, and then you are given medications, and then you are seen in the internet for follow-up. 
after one week. All right? And after that week, that is when you now are told to register for internet. And next slide. You register for Antineta. Now, those who register for Antineta are those who have decided that they want to register for Antineta here. For those who decide they want to do the Antineta elsewhere, it is at this point that we give you a letter and we say bye bye, God bless you. We hope to give to hear the good report when you deliver. It's very important. We hope to hear the good report when you deliver. Send us our baby pictures so that we'll see the baby, the products. All right. And so we're giving that, we give them the report. Some of them, then we decide they want to do their circuit even in, in that facility. So once you are done with your Lutia support, that is where that is what is compulsory for everybody. Treatment up until Lutia support is ended. Once you have completed Lutia support, then you cannot decide to transfer further care to another facility. For those who are not based in Abuja, of course, that is that is, is mandatory. You have to transfer your, your, your care to, your, to a center in your state or outside the country, all right? But for those who are within Abuja who still want to use another facility, why not? We don't, we don't say it must be here, all right? We are glad to allow you to go to, but we often would encourage you to use a good place, use a good center. All right, because you know what you have had to go through up until the stage that you are right now. All right, so if you continue with us after the cervical circle is one week after, it is time for you to register for um, antenatal care. And what does the antenatal care, what does it consist of? It consists of Afternoon, you're welcome. What does the Atlanta care consist of at the Juju Center for Women's Health? It consists of your regular Atlanta clinic visits, which is usually every two, two weeks. Every two, two weeks is when you have your Atlanta clinic visit from the beginning to 36 weeks and thereafter every week. Till you till you deliver, but I'm thinking we should extend that to that two weeks to four weeks. We are seeing our patients too frequently. <laughs> no one, they are shaking their head. No, 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 doctor. No, 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 MD. No way. You are actually the antenatal protocol generally for us, okay, in the country is that when a woman gets pregnant and you rest off antenata, you do, you see them every four weeks until they are 28 weeks. And every two weeks until they are 36 weeks. And then every week until they deliver. Now, if the patient has any challenge, any particular challenge, then you can reduce that frequency and make and see them more. All right. But for us, we treat all our patients as Special patients, yes. VIP. I mean, because it's not; it wasn't easy, and so that's why we see, we see you every two two weeks just to make sure that all is well. Okay, so the antenatal care is handled by. So you have antenatal clinics visits where you come in. Please, for everyone that is pregnant, when you come for your antenatal clinic visit, the things that must be done for you. Just note now so that if, it, if it's not done, you must demand for it. First, you must have your vital signs done. Very, very important. No matter how busy, oh, I want to just quickly come, I have an appointment. If you have not done your vital signs, even if you saw the MD hmm, and you spent 30 minutes, that another clinic visit is not complete. We have not done you a good service. Um, in the next antenatal class, I'm going to be talking about the internet, going to details about the antenatal care at the Center for Women's Health here. 
We want to tell you what to expect. So that if you don't, if you're not getting it, you start, de you'll be demanding for it. MD said, I'm supposed to have this done. I'm supposed to have this done and at this time. So your vital signs, your blood pressure, your pulse, your respiration, you do your SpO2, your weight, very important. I want to know whether if you're adding weight or not. All right? So you have all of those tests, all of those um, parameters checked, and then your urine, you do your, your analysis. There are a lot of information we get from just checking your urine. A lot of information, you won't believe it, just by just checking your urine. All right, so please don't say, ah, sorry, I just peed before I came. I'm not feeling pressed. You have missed opportunity. <laughs> So when you are coming for your clinic, Antineta, time yourself, all right? You time yourself. Make sure that when you are coming, you've just peed like one hour or so, so that by the time you are landing, you are getting to the clinic, you are pressed enough to give them urine, and then they check it. Again, I will go into details as to all the things that we get when we do your urine test so that you are aware, all right? And then before you now come in and then you have your checkup done, you do your scan. Please, if there are any questions you want to ask, please, we prefer you write it down if you will forget. So when you come into the clinic and you're meeting with your doctor or the nurse, you ask them questions, all right? Again, the, this antenatal class is also a forum a forum for us to ask questions. Any questions, any question at all, is an opportunity for us to interact so that uh, we can be properly be guided. All right? And then of course you have your, your blood tests. So for all of the patients who go through antenata, there are blood tests that are required to be done, okay? For those who did IVF and they did and then they got pregnant, some of those tests that are done, you already have done them before. So that is why we will not ask you to go and do this. For example, you have done your blood group, you have done your genotype, you have done your serology. So we don't repeat those tests again. Those are tests that are required for you to do when you are doing your booking to register for antenatal. Of course, by the time you are doing your cervical sectors, you would have done your full blood count. All right, and so that's why some of you may not have been asked to go and do those tests, but there are other tests that are required for you to do as you progress in the course of your antenatal care. All right, so Konga, next slide. So congratulations for making it thus far, at this point, you're done with your first trimester. And I want to believe that, uh, okay, I'm just looking at them. Some of you have, have passed this stage already. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Some of you have passed this stage. Some of you are about getting into this stage. Some of you are in this stage already and you are making progress. But whatever stage you are, congratulations. Okay, congratulations. It wasn't easy. God has been faithful. <laughs> okay, so you have made it through the first, for some of you here, you have made it through the first trimester. You have made it through the second trimester. All right, and these are all major achievements. Okay. Now, if you ask me, first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester, which, one, which, which is the most problematic? Now, somebody who has gone through the three of them, can you just say what you think? Cecilia. First and second. Okay. Who else has gone through first and second to know the difference? I've gone through only first. You have gone through only first. Okay. The first. The first one. Yes, the first one. Yes. Yes. 
I've not I've never been pregnant, but I've managed <laughs> but I've managed pregnant women. That's what I've been doing for for I mean how many years now? If you ask me, the first trimester is the most problematic. For some people, it's, it's less. For some, it can be terrible. Ah, you are blessed, oh. Oh, you are blessed. <laughs> you are so blessed. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. You are blessed. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So for a lot of people, the first trimester, for majority of, of couples, the first trimester is usually the most problematic because of the pregnancy symptoms, all right? Then once you get into the second trimester, there is a dramatic change. For me, I refer to that second trimester as the cruising phase. You know, when you are flying, when, when you board a plane, that first trimester is the takeoff. You can feel some boo 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 is going. <laughs> once you get to the cruising altitude, then you just relax. In fact, at that point, pilots can even put the plane on auto and come outside and be gisting with uh, passengers and just be having fun and, and sipping tea. That is how the second uh, trimester is. For majority, I don't know for some people, even the second trimester, things have not settled. But right for those who are carrying more than one, or for those who this is their very first pregnancy, okay? But for the majority, the second trimester, they suddenly will wake up and just discover that they're not pregnant anymore because they're not feeling anything. All this while they've been feeling symptoms of pregnancy, train of vomiting, ah, terrible. Then they just wake up. They go to bed pregnant and they wake up not feeling nothing. Ah, what has happened? Nothing has happened. Hospital, doctor, <laughs> nothing has happened. What has happened is that you have just transited from one phase to another. All right? And that phase is the very good phase. The food you could not eat before. Ah, nice. You're not be eating double, double, double. Because all this why you've been... And if you... If it was so bad that you had hypermesis gravidarum, meaning that you could not tolerate, you had to be admitted in hospital, you hardly take anything and it has stopped, you will notice that you would have lost weight. The second trimester will not be the time to not gain the weight that you have lost because at that time, you will not be able to eat and then things will really be looking good. And then the third trimester, that one comes, the third trimester is when you now begin to feel the manifestation of pregnancy. Different from the first trimester, because now you are now heavier, you are feeling pressure. You're not able to walk. Your, your walking step will not change from cat walking to dog walking. Anyone, I think will just be changing depending on. <laughs> All right. And then up until you are getting close to delivery. You just keep getting heavier and heavier. Legs swelling, different things will, will be happening. Not able to sleep well, not getting a good position to sleep. All of those things are things. We'll, we'll be getting into all of those things later on in, as we go through the antenatal classes for, for those who have just started. All right, you're going to be having a nice time. All right. And so up until delivery. All right. And what you feel. And what you experience differs from one woman to another, all right? Everybody is, is different, all right? But the assurances that we have is that by the grace of God, you will all make it, Amen. all right, and have a successful delivery, all right? Next slide.
Next slide. Okay, thank you very much. Questions? Yes. And which position is best to sleep? Is it left hand side or right hand side? Because right hand side doesn't allow me to be left. So position to sleep depending on depends on your stage of pregnancy. If you're in the first trimester, any position that is comfortable for you. All right. Up until first half of second trimester, by the time you're completing this. Second trimester, you need to start, start lying on your left lateral side. So the left is more advisable. More on the left, and then you shift to the right. And the reason why we want you to lie on your sides and not up back is because of the pressure that the uterus will have on your vessels. The vessels that return blood from your from your lower limbs, they go under the, under the uterus. And as the uterus gets bigger, they put the applied pressure on those vessels. And so if you lie on your back like this, flat, when you are in your third trimester, you will notice that you begin to feel faint. What is happening is that blood is not coming, it's not returning to your heart. And so your heart is not able to pump enough blood to your brain and your brain is not getting enough blood, getting hypoxic, and then you begin to feel as if you want to pass out. But when you lie on the sides, it takes off the pressure. The, the, the uterus is pushed away. And it does that more on the left side than on the right. But of course, you can't be lying all the time on your left. If not, that side will just become massive. So, you lie more on the left, and then sometimes you can move to the to the right. Now, some people, some women, left or right, it gets to a point where those two sides have been used and like they are not comfortable at all. So you can have there are some special pillows that are that you can order for, where you can that can help you to have a good position. It's not it's neither left nor right, but is not flat on your back. Sometimes if not on the bed right now, but even on the bed, if you can have, a time comes when you need to have like eight pillows on. Two pillows will not be enough. Eight pillows, you would put like four to form a support at your back so that you don't sleep flat, but you sleep like, that you can only adopt in the hospital because of those beds we have that can roll. You don't have that at home. The way you can create that is to have enough pillows so that you can put it and you are elevated up. All right. So you are not you are lying on your back, but you're not lying on your back. You're lying at an angle. All right. And then even when you lie on the side, there are pillows to support the tummy. This one is particularly important for women who are carrying more than one. Those who are carrying like three, they need extra support. <laughs> because it's not easy. But in that third trimester, so you need a lot of people. So that's, that's, that's what you do. So either side is okay, but more on the left, on the left side. All right? Okay. Yes. Right, what about when you when you have exhausted the two sides and one of the hip is one of the hip is training you? In short, both sides becomes painful when you are lying down. Yeah, 
Okay, just a minute. Uh, please, for those of you that are online, if you have a question, we will soon move to you, okay? So you just hold on. Once we're done with those that are in-house, we will ask you to, to ask your questions. So the first thing you said was paint. Mm, what is the problem with that? No, generally, even if you're even though you're not even if you're not pregnant, on once you paint the place, you have to allow the place to dry before before you move in. So, well, for pregnant women, it can be exaggerated because smell, any kind of smell at all, can generally just affect them. So, what you do is either you pack out, you move to somewhere to a hotel <laughs> for some days. Why they do a makeover? But seriously, ah, you must prepare for this for this baby. <laughs> so if you want to paint the place and you know, and again, it also depends on the sensitivity. All right. As long as you're you are you are not there, you permit mean, they're painting one of the room, you it's painted and then you move to another side, no problem. But if you're quite sensitive and you cannot withstand the smell, there's a point that cannot withstand any smell at all, no matter the smell. Husband cannot come close. Just be, just be far. You come to work, you drop your shoes are far off. I don't want to even, and then you just take off, just go somewhere. Uh, it's that bad. Some women are that sensitive, but not, uh, not, but not all women. So it depends on what. Uh, but generally, you don't want to go into a place that has just been painted. You must give it time for it to, for it to dry up and then to air. So you just, and that can be just a couple of days. Then relaxer. Mm. Well, I, I, I don't know. Um, the, I'm not sure that the normal relaxer that women use, as long as it's not affecting you, it's not affecting your health. I don't think it will affect your baby. Because the the babies, this thing, it's not just so direct. Oh. You think that once you just do relax, I just go and just affect baby like that. It doesn't work that. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. The protection that baby has is not a joke. So I, I don't think I don't think, if the relaxer is not harming you as a person, I don't think it will affect your baby. Because what is not good for you will first of all get into your blood. Do you understand? Before it even have a risk, a chance of even being transmitted, and the fact that it's in your blood does not automatically mean that it will get to the baby. Do you understand? That is why sometimes even women who have HIV they don't automatically transmit it to their babies. It's not as your blood and baby's blood are not mixing together. There's a barrier. All right. So I don't think uh, that will prevent you from. From, from relaxing your hair, okay? All right, um, any question from those online? So let's, let's give those online to ask their questions. Any question? Yes, there is. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yeah. What about when you've slept, you've exhausted both sides, and the heat that they are not paining you? What do you have to do there? Yeah, so, so that's what I said. That, that's what I said, that sometimes it can be a very difficult situation where you have slept on both sides and it's paining. So you need to now get um, pillows to give you an inclined position. Or there are some, there are some medicine that you can get, these sleeping pillows. That, yes, sleeping pillows that can help you to get a more comfortable position and they provide a lot of support. So that is what, so that is what you can do. Okay. And right. secondly, yes, sir. And secondly, after circulation, I mean, my second trimester, it's time, uh, trimester, do. Then after your circulation, is it advisable to sleep with your husband? Oh, okay. Thank you for that question. Now, after cervical cyclage, yeah. 
there is still prohibition against um, sexual intercourse for another two months. So 